Okay. So good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. We're happy to welcome you to our third webinar from GOAN. And on behalf of GOAN, I would like to wish you all the best for 2021. Cannot be worse on 2020, hopefully. Uh, a few announcements. So all the participants are being muted and the cameras are being turned off. So only the speakers and the organizer will have access to, to the microphone and the cameras. So uh, we will be recording the whole webinar. And uh, for those who you know cannot attend, we will put on one of the slides the link and the chat box, actually, the link where to, you can have access to the webinar afterwards. So the format today, uh, we will have a 20 minutes talk plus 10 minute question. And uh, Laura Ramajo will start. And our second speaker will be Christopher Gobbler from Stony Brook University. And again, 20 minutes talk and 10 minute questions. So hopefully you will have many questions. So please enter them in the question box on the right hand side of your screen, not in the chat box, in the question box. And uh, I will ask those questions on your behalf to the speaker. If we don't have time to go through all the questions, they are being kept and we will forward them to the speaker and they will be able to answer them to you. Another point, uh, maybe on the next slide, is if you want to submit an abstract uh, for participating to an upcoming webinar, you are on the site here and uh, we are really looking forward to your submissions. So our first speaker today will be uh, Laura Ramaggio. Sorry if I pronounced bad. Laura is presently a scientist at the Center of Advanced Study in Arizona in Coquimbo, Chile. And Laura got a bachelor in biology by University of Chile, a master in ecology by the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid and a PhD in Global Change in the Mediterranean Institute of Advanced Study, IMEDEA, CSIC, in Mallorca, Spain, and she was under Professor Carlos Zuarte's supervision. So Laura's research interests are focused really on the study of the environmental and biogeochemical variability and its impact on the physiology and fitness of marine species. And currently, her research seeks to understand the physiological mechanism that coastal species express to face environmental conditions imposed by upcoming events of different intensity, frequency, and duration in northern Chile, where she works, and how this mechanism may provide tolerance and resistance to climate change, such as ocean deoxygenation or ocean acidification. So today, she will talk about the multi stressor scenario of air polling and their impact on the Chilean Calop aquaculture. We are all looking forward to hearing your talk, and the floor is yours, Laura. Okay, thank you, Veronique. Okay. To start sharing my slide. Okay. okay. I don't know. Can you see my yeah, presentation? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Nice. nice. Well, thank you, Verani, for the introduction and for the invitation to this webinar. Well, uh, as Verani said, uh, I'm researcher and, and researcher and the Center of for Advanced Studies in Arizona in, in the North Chile. And today is a pleasure to show you some um, some results of the of the um, research that has been developing in Chile for the last seven uh, six seven years in order to understand how this is important resource in Chile is going to be affected by climate change and for the and for the natural environmental uh, viability. So first of all, I would like to oh what happened. Is 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 okay? Ah, oh, yeah. Or is it? Ah, okay. Now, 
First of all, I, I would like to, uh, to, to show a bit of history of this important resource in, in Chile, because this species has been explored from the, from, from the last 40, 50 years, first as fishery by collecting the animals or the organisms from the natural beds, but it was uh, the, there was a time in, in the early 90s that the government has to take some measure some measurements to avoid the, the total loss of the natural beds. And this was the point for the aquaculture industry or, or to start the aquaculture of these species in the north of Chile. And uh, more recently, we have been observed that the, the most of the species of other mollusk species has been uh, subjected to aquaculture, has been increasing uh, in the time. But we can see that the scale of production is very, very uh, variable. And since 2007, has been observed a reduction in their production. And today, we don't know exactly which are the factor or the combination of factors that are uh, the, the results of this decrease in the production because can be social or, or, or uh, also market or economic or even environmental or climate change. So this is the reason because this species is suggested to, uh, there is a, a great uh, interest to study this species. Well, this species is uh, distributed between uh, Panama to the central South Chile, but only I'm going to focus in the north of Chile. We can find this species uh, in, in, the, in the north of Chile between 18 and 30 de latitude degrees, and it's exposed a lot of uh, environmental variability, mainly because we can find a, a very relevant uh, sea surface temperature gradient along the Chilean coast, uh, a PCO2 also uh, um, uh, gradient, and the the presence of uh, the presence of the oxygen minimum zone is also affecting the the oxygen condition. But one of the most important uh, uh, the processes or natural process that are affecting the habitat of this species is that dwelling uh, that is uh, that present a semi-permanent or permanent condition uh, in in its habitat. I'm going only to focus in Tongoy Bay. This is a uh, this is this bay is located at 30 degrees latitude in the North Chile, and it's the main place where this species is. Um, uh, is, is uh, culture. And you can see here Punta Lengua de Vaca. This is the most active and uh, one of the most active upwelling centers in the north of Chile. And his, uh, his activity is affecting all the environmental conditions of, the, of, uh, of uh, a part of the coast of Chile. Uh, as I say, this is the main place in Chile. Uh, where this species is culture, and you can see here the space used for the uh, aquaculture industry for the culture of this species. This is not the total species, the space, because this is this is uh, there are also artisanal aquacultures that use more space than this, but only to give a number probably between the 70 and the 90 percent of the scallops produced in Chile coming from this uh, from this part of, of from this bay and as i say this also this uh, uh, bay is affected by one, one by one of the most active at welling centers in the north of chile this is punta lengua de vaca who present um which is presenting a semi permanent uh, a cycle that is more active during the austral summer uh, uh, spring summer month uh, uh, pro, uh, mainly due to the, the migration of the uh, to the migration to the south of the South Pacific anticyclone. When uh, this um, when this uh, when this upwelling center is active, the wind stress in the zone uh, start to increase, and this is highly related with the environmental condition of Tongoy Bay and other related on, or near uh, zones. But you can see there is a, 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 high, a high decrease in the sea surface temperature condition uh, due to the properties of well uh, water. 
but also, however, to a day there is a lack of information about how many other uh, variables that are impacted by a dwelling process uh, are affecting Tongoy Bay. So, because we know that at welling waters are rich in nutrient, high in CO2, low pH, present uh, low pH condition, and also present low oxygen concentration. And this is very interesting uh, and, and uh, for, for our system in, in Chile because this is predicted that uh, some at welling, um, welling zone are going to be affected by climate change. Uh, or, or not even all the outwelling systems are showing the same magnitude for direction of the change, but we can expect, expect um, that if uh, outwelling intensity is going to increase by a permanent migration of the South Pacific anticyclone, uh, import change in, in the primary productivity or in the productivity of the coast could happen. And this is mainly because, because under a, a higher or stronger upwelling intensity, a, a stronger turbulent autopensio process is, could happen. And this also increase the level of uncertainty about what is going to happen with the community related and also with the with the global fuel security because until date we have very low uncertainty about what is going to happen uh, in 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 the Humboldt current system at welling center this is mainly because with uh, there is a low degree of confidence in detection and attribution and this is because we don't have a uh, integrate a uh, permanent observational um, system that set or, or that provide information about what is happening in the environmental, physical, um, and chemical and biological parameters. But what we know about the physiological sensitivity of this species to south welling? Well, this species has been broadly studied in the last years, in the 15, 40 years, because there is an interest to increase or expand the area where this species, um, this species is going, uh, where this species can be cultured, and also because there is an interest to improve the production. So, uh, a lot of the studies about uh, change in temperature, salinity, food quality, food quantity has been developed. But today I'm only going to present uh, data of experiment that, that we have performed in order to understand how at welling drivers, environmental drivers or environmental drivers uh, subjected to change by at uh, affect this species. We start how to understand what is the role of food supply uh, to confront low pH condition in the context of ocean acidification. And we observe very unexpected results uh, and we observe that this species present very good performance, very good performance under low pH uh, condition, even uh, e, and this performance is even better under high food supply. Uh, you you can see here that the metabolism, the metabolic rate, the growth rate, calcification rate, or even the feeding rates are higher on the low pH condition and even higher when we provide more food that in the treatment with lower food. And this also happened for more macro uh, physiological uh, parameter, but also we observe that we uh, that, that the, in the expression of stress protein, for example, too. And this is very interesting because it's providing information about certain adaptation to low pH condition uh, of this species and explain why this species is so successful in an environment of a welling. Next, Lagos et al. Uh, uh, in 2016 pro, uh, performed an experiment where tried to understand what is the role of pH and temperature and he observes very similar results that the last study that he present in terms of net calcification higher net calcification on the low pH condition. This is very weird in comparison with other species, uh, very strange in, in comparison with other calcifying, calcifying species. But he ups, they observe that a lower pH, uh, lower growth condition, uh, lower growth rate under pH, low pH condition. And well, with, uh, with uh, one reason of that, uh, that is 
is that they performed the study on their adults and we are going to see uh, later that the um, that the, the the site of the life state of these organisms is a very important variable to consider about the sensitivity of upwelling uh, under upwelling. But the the good thing is that observed that they're good uh, on their well a better performance also on the higher temperature uh, under temperature. Well, as I say, these studies were performed in in the under the ocean acidification context, but we realize that well this is very difficult because we expose the, the well it's very difficult to determine what is going to happen in the future because the 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 treatment that we apply to this experiment are inside uh, are, are not probably the the future values that is going to be uh, as model projects so we now start to understand or, or to study how uh, these species respond in, in the context of environmental variability. So we have uh, in the middle of the bay, in the bay, Tongay Bay, we have a oceanographic and meteorological station that is recording a high frequency, a lot of uh, atmospheric and oceanographic um, uh, variables. Also, we have performed for the last four years, a weekly sampling, uh, a sampling at week, a weekly uh, every week, uh, in terms to understand the carbon system, the nutrient system, the chlorophyll, and other variables. But this information is very useful to understand or to provide information for the experiment at laboratory, for example, to understand how they respond to maximum, average, and minimum values. So we perform this experiment that would try to understand what was the response of this species to isolated and combined uh, 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 combined variables of pH, temperature, and oxygen conditions, and we measure what happened with growth metabolism classification. We also work in, bio, uh, in, in mineralogical studies, but I'm not going to present here because we don't have time, but we understand a lot of well what are the biomineralogical mechanisms of these species under these as well in drivers. Only to simplify a bit this, you can see here, these are the treatment of wind uh, no at welling condition during winter and summer condition and here this is that welling condition this is the treatment in laboratory that mimic the, these conditions so we performed the study using values that are in the maximum average and minimum values that this species is uh, usually confronting in their habitat and we can see that under a uh, under uh, at welling condition, we can expect a lower growth uh, grow rate. However, um, uh, however, ah, and and well, we don't observe also change in the metabolic rate, but we observe that the uh, the calcification rate were even higher. And this is so in that a specific or maybe. Uh, the, the presence of a physiological trait of between growth and calcification. And, and well, we observed also that the performance under higher temperature was always better, but this has very uh, a fitness cost in, in this is in this the in juveniles of the scalos, and we observed that under uh, during the experiment. We observe a higher mortality under the, 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 the higher temperature treatment, and this mortality was even um, was even uh, uh, higher under epoxic treatment and, and start at the beginning of the experiment. That this is suggesting that epoxia and low oxygen. Uh, Condition are are important to define the the performance of this species and and the fitness, and also the presence of mechanisms. But finally, uh, uh, a not very good response to maintain these mechanisms, probably due to the lack of energy or metabolic uh, energy. But we went to the field. We went uh, the last year that. Two years ago, we went to the field and want to know what is now happening in the during that welling season. So we performed a field experiment 
uh, during the spring and summer season. And first of all, well, we define three uh, random periods where we check how the organisms are responding. We were very lucky about when we finished this experimental period, but we observed that the Tongoy Bay is very variable in terms of temperature, in terms of oxygen concentration, pH, and also chlorophyll. And you can see also that, uh, well, we measured these environmental properties of the, in the, along of the water column because the, the culture of this species is between five and 30 meters. So we want to understand uh, what is happening with the organisms that is uh, that are uh, culture um, culture uh, at deeper depths. So you can see that there is a lot of variables uh, in well temperature is you can see here the range between 12 and 17 degrees, the the the, the low levels of oxygen in, in the water columns uh, during that welling season. Also, you can see that uh, the, the low pH condition that are very low and are out the range of the treatment that we use in the first experiment. And also the, the, the conditions, uh, the, the high variability of uh, the values in the, in the chlorophyll of food supply for this species. But I want to stress that oxygen and chlorophyll were the, the present the, the higher variability in terms of uh, for both depths uh, during this this experiment that range between 63 to 20 in case of uh, oxygen or even more in, in chlorophyll. We observe that these environmental and biogeochemical conditions at Tongor Gate are modulated by the wind intensity at Tong on Punta Lengua de Vaca at Welling Center. You can see here we calculate the Eggman transport when more negative at these um, these values, uh, the the at the wind stress is higher and that welling is present. So you can see that the, during the first period, the Ekman transport was uh, was uh, higher and the temperature and the DOD pH and the uh, it was lower and the chlorophyll was higher. This is a typical pattern of the presence of uh, welling waters in the seawater. As the Eggman transport uh, increase or, or that, welling that welling intensity decrease, we can see an increase in the temperature uh, in the oxygen, in the pH, and uh, we we can discuss this later. But there was a, a, a important decrease in the chlorophyll condition, and this is happen or this happened in the entire column. It's from zero to twenty three. Degrees. We use the temperature, high frequency temperature, and oxygen register during the experiment to calculate uh, uh, through the temperature and, and dissolved oxygen anomaly how many cooling and desoxygenation events occurring occurring during the first, the three periods, the intensity and the number and the duration and the and the duration of this event. Well, here you can see uh, in this part of the table, in the first part of the table, you can see that statistically there is a high correlation, a significant correlation between Eman transport and temperature and dissolved condition. But also I want to stress that during the first, during the experiment, there was a increase in the number of cooling events, desoxygenation events um, from period one to period three, but there was an, uh, and, but the periods, this, this lower period uh, presented higher duration. So it was, uh, we can see that cooling event or desigenation event um, lasted from nine to 13 days uh, in the water column. And also I want to highlight the intensity of these events was very in terms of this oxygenation event and no and in cooling event it was not so clear but the intensity of this event were in terms of oxygen the loss of oxygen in the column was very very high during during the first period in that when we uh, uh, analyzed the data from the from the scale for the other th uh, three periods we can determine that the number and most of Probably the duration and intensity of the cooling and desoxygenation event 
uh, were modulating the physiology and the fitness of Algopestin purpuratu during that willing season. And you can see that, well, in the first part of the experiment, when the boiling conditions were higher, we observed higher classification, higher growth rates, and higher metabolic rate. And this, uh, there was a negative trend uh, uh, to, from the period one to the period three. But this has this better performance under a welling condition or higher or stronger welling condition has very bad. Um, uh, consequence on the mortality rate, and we lost probably we lost the 45, the almost the half of the organism, experimental organism. Also, I want to stress that the condition in the water column at deeper depths are always present: lower pH, low oxygen, low chlorophyll, and low temperature. And well, the mortality and uh, also this uh, cal growth classification. Um, uh, parameter was also uh, in this case uh, lower and the mortality was al also higher. Uh, well, this is a visual. Uh, you can see here that uh, after five months of experiment, this is the, the, the experimental scallop how, and you can see the different, the visual difference between the scallop that were um, that were exposed to 22. D uh, meters of nine uh, meters, and you can see that at uh, at uh, lower depth, uh, the organisms are much uh, where we we recover more and also bigger organisms in comparison with 22 meter depth organisms. Well, uh, because we don't have time, we have performed a lot of uh, experiment at field, but we um, uh, I would like to show this uh, thing that we performed a similar experiment, but during all year, in order to understand how at seasonal scale uh, contains these uh, parameters, physiological parameter, we observed as we expected that during the spring, when at welling season is stronger, the uh, grow rates, the net calcification rate. Uh, are lower, also the, calcifi the calcification rates are higher, and finally, not uh, and this is important in, in order to perform the experiment, not all the size or the life state respond equally to at welling. So we can see that higher organisms respond, uh, respond negatively, more negatively to at welling condition, and this is probably at, uh, uh, an issue of energy because they are uh, using the energy for reproductive, uh, uh, for retro reproductive process. And well, we this is a summary. Uh, we observed that during the spring and summer, the mortality was very high in comparison with autumn and winter and winter seasons. Finally, I want to show that this is this experiment and all the research that we have performed in Tongoy Bay is a joint effort to work on adaptation to climate change. And we are working together with the industry, with the governmental institution, with educational institution, and with the academy. And now we have a, a, a project for the next a, a idea to work in, in global change adaptation for the aquaculture industry in Tongoy Bay. So this is my presentation. And uh, well, this is a, a painting that that was made uh, in, in the um, in Tongoy Bay School that stressed the, the importance of resource activity. Here is the the, the observational station, the scale of and everything. This is all for me. I don't know if it's okay the time. Thank you, Laura. You're a bit, a uh, couple of minutes uh, above schedule, but uh, never mind. Just thank you for this very stimulating talk and let us know about what's going on in northern Chile. So we have a couple of questions which I will ask you. So somebody is asking, in cases of the high temperature, deoxygenation, high climate change, and low food security, how the innovative method to overcome this? Can they be making the food supplementary for the aquatic organisms to make notes for the scientists by using these modern methods? Is that right? So in other words, can you translate those findings for helping, you know, scallop aquaculture people? 
Ah, okay. Yeah. Well, um, first, all this information is is continuously uh, exposed to the to the community that is in that is uh, culture in this resource. So we discuss uh, continuously how to define. Uh, the next experiment. For example, they have some doubts about the food, the, the kind of food, or, or when they have to accelerate maybe the, the process to to pick up the animals from the to pick up the animals from the field. So usually, well, this is a very start working that we start working with that. So we hope that in the next five years we can provide a better adaptation and measures to 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 help to the industry and the artisanal aquacultures. I don't know if it was the, the question because it was so long. So I yeah thank you. I have another one. Uh, Kirsten is asking how you calculated the percentage of the variability for pH as it is a logarithmic scale the variability should be higher. Ah well, this was yeah. I I did this uh, this uh, calculation very quick uh, for the presentation, but yeah, maybe maybe the the, the variability is is going to be uh, is going to be uh, higher. But in terms of of pH, we observed that that oxygen was the the main the main uh, the main variable in, in, uh, with chlorophyll. Okay, uh, we have another question. What was the average stocking density per unit during the experiment? Per unit so average. What, what is the average? What was the average stocking density per unit area during the experiment? Ah, we use uh, we use the same the, this well we we use the 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 same culture method that the industry use. So we were uh, constantly advised by the the culture industry, and we move the animals uh, as the animal were grow uh, were bigger. So I, I don't remember the the salting number, but the idea of this experiment was to mimic what the industry is doing in the water. So we follow the same the same protocol that they have. Okay, I, I, I have a question. So in fact, some of the uh, physiological metabolism, gross metabolism or calcification or decalcification, sometimes they're uh, winners, sometimes they're losers, right? So overall, uh, and we don't have the same uh, worst scenario when you combine hypoxia plus uh, low pH. So overall, for the squalop aquaculture, what would you be your feeling? Is it a positive or a fully negative impact when you combine low pH and low O2? Yeah, we have to observe that it is normal that during a quelling season, the, the calcification was is higher. But this it has a negative impact over the size of the of the organism, and this is very important for the industry because they sell the the organisms are sell uh, by size. So how there is a trade-off in terms of energy if they uh, use more energy for calcification pro, uh, processes, they are not using for growth. So finally, they obtain a smaller individuals. So I think it's not going to be a winner. Probably it's going to 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 maintain and but but the, but I think that maybe in the future they are going to be to be smaller. So probably the the price uh, at which they are sell is going to be lower also. Okay, thank you, Laura. I think we we managed our thirty minutes. Uh, time slot. So we, I would like to thank you for your uh, very stimulating talk. And I'm going to present our second speaker, Christopher Gobler from Stony Brook University in Southampton, New York State in the US.
So Chris is presently the director of the New York State Center for Clean Water Technology in Stony Brook University. He got a master in marine environmental science and a PhD in coastal oceanography from Stony Brook University in 1999. And he became professor in 2012 and director of the academic program in Stony Brook. A long list of honors and awards. I just want to mention he did a lot of briefing to the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate, and is one of the founding members of the IOC UNESCO Global Hub Network. His research interests include understanding the dynamics of harmful algal blooms, understanding how climate change and coastal solution acidification affect marine organisms and ecosystems, and understanding the functioning and the trophic status of the shallow marine ecosystem and potential phase shift into coastal ecosystem. But all this work is using multiple approach, combining them, field study, lab experiments, field work, molecular investigation, and more. Today, it will talk about co-occurrence of apoxia, harmful algal blooms, and other climate change tracer and what are the implications for aquatic life. So we're all looking forward to your talk and, and the floor is yours, Chris, go ahead. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, good morning from the United States, where it's an exciting day. As you may know, our president has actually finally left the White House after uh, a tumultuous four years. So there's, there's reason to celebrate. Um, so my talk today is going to focus um, largely on a uh, take a lot of ideas from a review paper that was published uh, just a year ago in a special issue in the journal Harmful Algae that was on climate change and harmful algal blooms. You can see the paper uh, that I published there, a review paper about the idea of harmful algal blooms as a co-stressor. I'll also be presenting some ideas that I shared and we shared as a group uh, in a, a joint meeting between uh, the GON group and also Global Hab. Uh, time not too long ago when we actually couldn't have nice in-person meetings. And here's hoping we're back to those sorts of meetings um, in 2021. So just very briefly, I know we all know all these things, but we live in a changing world. Uh, the temperature record for 2020 just came in uh, and affirm that 2020 was the warmest year on record as a tie with 2016. We know how that's affecting our global oceans with regards to oxygen content and hypoxic events. We know how CO2 is changing in the atmosphere and how that's affecting uh, the ocean pH. Um, and as I think we just heard in the last presentation that Laura presented, you know, when you're in a coastal zone, you don't need to think about these stressors with regards to the future because they're here right now. Um, and so in a little bit different scenario than an upwelling scenario, in some of the estuaries that I work in on the east coast of the United States, um, what we find is that the hypoxia, firstly, we get, the, just like in an upwelling zone, co-occurrence of hypoxia and acidification. That's shown here. Uh, this is a vertical section plot of an estuary. Uh, this is actually New York City, so transitioning from New York City, the nation's largest metropolis, uh, out through Long Island Sound, there is a dead zone there. And of course, when you have a dead zone with low oxygen, it's also very acidified. Note the pHs. This is a, actually a pH of seven. Uh, and in, various, in the same system, we see the uh, co-occurrence of very low oxygen with very high levels of CO2. Again, these are levels we don't expect to see um, maybe ever in our oceans, but they do occur in coastal systems. Uh, and we also know that coastal systems are vulnerable to the to heat waves uh, that are not far off from what we predict for the future. So here's the east coast, the west coast of the United States, uh, showing uh, degree Fahrenheit anomalies of uh, more than five degrees, um, not very common. Uh, but moving to harmful algal blooms, um, you can see the statement here. There's a consensus amongst harmful algal bloom scientists that the impacts of these events have been increasing in recent decades. And you can see that. Um, here's a map contrasting the occurrence of uh, pyrolytic shellfish poisoning events from 1970 to what we know to be more recently. Another paper that I co-published with Rafe Cadella 
showing what we had with regards to blooms caused by cochlodinium or margolepidinium uh, before 1990, and then now in this uh, century. And we know that part of this is being driven by climate change. Um, this is a paper uh, my group published uh, in uh, PNAS a few years back, showing the change in what we call the bloom season. So how long can a bloom of a given harmful algal bloom persist in a given year? And for this particular harmful algal bloom, Alexandrium, which likes somewhat cooler temperatures, uh, in lower latitudes, its bloom season is shrinking. But in the Northeast United States and through much of Northern Europe, uh, the duration of that bloom season is getting longer and longer every year as the this regions uh, of the ocean warms. Uh, and so again, being driven by, harmful algal bloom being driven by change in climate. And so while we know what the typical considered climate change stressors are, uh, with regards to temperature, acidification, hypoxia, you know, I would argue we need to add harmful algal blooms to this mix. Um, and I'll, I'll also argue that even if you have a harmful algal bloom that's not being promoted by climate change, the fact of the matter is, as our oceans become more, become warmer, more hypoxic, uh, more acidified, um, that's going to co-occur with harmful algal blooms that may or may not be more frequent, but they're a co-stressor, and uh, and I'm going to show, talk more about that. Um, and in some place, in some cases, um, people like to think of these four things together as something known as the four horsemen of the ocean climate change apocalypse. So all of these things contributing to uh, a negative impact on marine life. So with that as an introduction and as a basic concept, I now want to focus a little bit on hypoxia and these harmful algal blooms. Now. We're all well aware with how algal blooms contribute to hypoxia. So here's an image talking about what happens in the Gulf of Mexico. And, um, and um, we all know this story where nutrients promote an algal bloom that dies off. And after the algal bloom dies or is grazed down, then there's bacterial metabolism. And then that leads to uh, hypoxia. And my group has generated certainly data to show this. Uh, I'm going to show the auction in a second, but here's two years in a place called Jamaica Bay, um, which is in New York City. Um, and this is these, this is a vertical profiling um, stand, which shows with depth the levels of chlorophyll. I'm about to show you what the time is, but you can see a series in two years of algal blooms occur. Uh, now here's the dates. And so what I'd like to show you, or what you can probably clearly see, is that we have algal blooms coincident with high levels of dissolved oxygen. And if you can't see here, the oxygen peaks at 12 milligrams per liter and the red is to zero. So every time we get an algal bloom, we see in our surface waters, the uh, oxygen levels are well oxygenated. You can see that repeated in the following year. Um, but what I'd also like to emphasize is how low the, this extended hypoxia events that we see in both years uh, occur when there's no chlorophyll or no algal blooms whatsoever. So this is what we typically expect, right? We get basification by the algal bloom and acidification in its absence. And if we plot the data together in a single plot that considers pH, dissolved oxygen, but now also whoa, being colorized. Um, so you can see here, the, the redder it is, the higher the chlorophyll. Again, you see this basification and this super saturation of oxygen with an algal bloom, but then know what happens in the absence of an algal bloom, the system just collapses into being a zone of hypoxia and acidification. And we can also see this on a diurnal basis. Um, here's taking the, all the data, but now plotting it from uh, midnight uh, to noon, then back to midnight. Uh, and what you see is at night when there's no photosynthesis, you get these sags in both pH and, as you can see, oxygen. During the day, you get, the again, the supersaturation um, and the high levels of pH. But what I'd like to emphasize is that, is that this Jamaica Bay is a system that experiences diatom blooms. But not all algal blooms are formed by diatoms. Diatoms are typically not harmful. So my question, or what I'd like to talk about now, is how the algal bloom relationship changes when it's a harmful algal bloom. 
And to do that, I'm going to borrow on a uh, event that occurred on Long Island a few years back. Uh, was within the New York Times, very large fish kill of millions of fish uh, spread across the shorelines. Uh, and thankfully, we had right in the middle of where the fish kill occurred, uh, a monitoring sound so we could look at what was happening there. And that's what's shown here. So what we're looking at here are the changes in chlorophyll leading up to the bloom. Now remember, I, what I had said is that typically these events, the, the sequence is algal bloom, death of algal bloom, hypoxia, fish kill. Note what's happening here. The chlorophyll levels are increasing. Now if I show you, and those chlorophyll levels are due to a harmful species within a genera of uh, gymnodinium, but here's the oxygen levels. So note what's happening here. As the algal bloom develops, at night we're experiencing full anoxia for, in some cases, up to 10 hours. And that's when the fish kill occurred, not after the bloom, but actually as this bloom was intensifying. I'll talk about why this is momentarily, but I'll, I'll first emphasize this is a dinoflagellate. And I'll second also say, besides its effect on oxygen, it also can affect fish. So that's another complicating factor. This is just an image of the gill lamellae of the fish. This is what a lamellae should look like. Here you can see that same lamellae, but being clogged with mucus and actually the algal cells. It's certainly contributing. I'm going to turn to a second type of harmful algal bloom now, uh, known as coccolidinium, uh, or also margolepidinium, polycricoides. Um, and what you can see here is these are very dense and widespread blooms that discolor the water. Um, and can uh, very common across estuaries, particularly on the east coast of the United States, and are known as specifically fish killing harmful algal blooms. Um, we've seen that in our marine labs. Uh, fishermen have also seen that if they use these devices called pound nets, where their fish, uh, when a bloom moves in, will kill off the fish. Um, now, typically we've thought about this because we assume that this organism, the uh, coccodinium, is. Uh, excreting reactive oxygen species. But what I'd like to show you now is the dynamics of oxygen during one of these blooms. Here we had two different sounds, both in surface waters and in bottom waters. Uh, and what I'd like to show you here is that it doesn't matter during the bloom, whether you're in the surface or the bottom, we get, again, this supersaturation uh, during the day. But now with this harmful algal bloom, Again, just as I showed you during the mass of fish kill, the oxygen levels are going to zero every single night. And this is not normal. This is when we were in the midst of one of these blooms. As soon as the bloom ended, the hypoxia went away and the anoxia went away. So this is, you know, and this continuous data set. So the bloom ended all at once uh, on this date on September 10th. And as soon as it goes away, we still have our day-night cycles. But we don't see the anoxia or hypoxia at night. And we also don't see the supersaturation. Uh, so some of these high biomass blooms caused by dinoflagellates can lead to hypoxia. And so just to go over a few points of why that might be. Um, so causing hypoxia not after the bloom, but in the midst of the bloom. Again, here's the midst of the bloom and here's the hypoxia. You don't need to wait for the bloom to end. So why might that be? Well, there's a lot of carbon tied up in these blooms. That carbon is going to stimulate bacterial respiration. These high biomass blooms also lead to low light and depress photosynthetic rates. Uh, and we know that many of these dinoflagellates can be heterotrophic. So instead of photosynthesizing, they're undergoing phagotrophy and osmotrophy, which is actually going to um, be, be, make these blooms heterotrophic and a net consumer of oxygen. They're not producing oxygen particularly at night. Um, these events also tip, typically happen when the warmer, uh, when the weather is warmer and temperatures are lower. Uh, and importantly, as climate change continues, the co-occurrence of hypoxia and these harmful algal blooms will become more common uh, because we know the oxygen levels will continue to decline as temperatures increase. So hopefully I've convinced you that harmful algal blooms are co-occurring with hypoxia and other climate change stressors. Uh, and they're one of the climate change stressors. How is that affecting marine life? I don't have time to go into all the details of this figure, but within that paper I pointed out, uh, we did come up with this figure essentially trying to emphasize how these different climate change stressors 
interact with harmful algal blooms and the fact that in surface waters and pelagic organisms may be more likely to interact with harmful algal blooms uh, and things like warmer temperatures. Um, whereas if you're dealing with benthic organisms, as we sort of just heard, uh, they'll be more likely to inter be experiencing hypoxia and acidification. But many of these harmful algal blooms also vertically migrate. That's what dinoflagellates do. They go up and down and they're down at night. Uh, so it's at night when you have hypoxia and acidification, you'll also have the co-occurrence of these harmful algal blooms. So this being the case, let's look into the literature and see what we know about harmful algal blooms and these co-stressors. And we did that in that paper and the answer is not very fulfilling. And that is specifically, um, if you look at, for example here, this is a, a massive meta-analysis. We found a, a total of less than 10 papers that are looking at the effects of these climate change co-stressors and harmful algal blooms. And we found one paper that considered the co-effect of a harmful algal bloom uh, and hypoxia. And that happened to actually be in a freshwater system. And so just to convince you that the co-occurrence of hypoxia and harmful algal blooms does occur, uh, this is actually a pond on the campus at my university that is not very pleasant to look at at times. Um, it experiences harmful algal blooms. You can see freshwater harmful algal blooms by microcystis. Um, and this plot just simply shows it can also experience uh, anoxic events and hypoxic events, crashes in oxygen, co-occurring with fairly high levels of the toxin microcystin. Uh, but again, there's been one study to tell us about this. So the final point I'd like to wrap up on is what this means from a policy point of view. Now, earlier this year, my graduate student and I published this paper in Science, thinking about dissolved oxygen policies and how they're built to consider co-stressors, and rather the fact that dissolved oxygen policies are not considering co-stressors. We really emphasize pH, but the points we made in this paper apply to all the other um, climate change stressors, including harmful algal blooms. So in the United States, um, actually, hopefully as of today, we'll get back our Environmental Protection Agency, uh, and that's built for uh, aquatic systems around something known as the Clean Water Act. It regulates the discharge of pollutants in surface waters and has certain standards um, for different water quality parameters. Um, so for example, there is a dissolved oxygen guideline, but that guideline is made independent of any other co-stressors. It doesn't consider pH or any other co-stressor, including harmful algal blooms. Uh, and we know, as we even saw in the last presentation, uh, that when you have two stressors together, it totally changes the effect on important fishery species. Um, and so I'd conclude with the fact or the idea that the co-occurrence of acidification and harmful algal blooms uh, or their toxins is probably more harmful than the co-occurrence of acidification or hypoxia, I have acidification, I should say hypoxia, uh, but it's more harmful than the hypoxia alone. Uh, and so the Clean Water Act and likely other policies, because a lot of other policies across the globe are built on the Clean Water Act, for example, in Brazil and in China, um, these policies are likely less protective of aquatic life and fisheries than we hope. So to wrap up, um, you know, one of my main points here is that harmful algal blooms are a climate change co-stressor and do need to be considered because those harmful algal blooms can have severe effects on aquatic life. Uh, when we traditionally think about harmful, just algal blooms in general, uh, we think about a sequence of events. The algal bloom occurs, the algal bloom dies, and then you have hypoxia. But what I've shown you today is that some harmful algal blooms directly and immediately cause hypoxia. So the hypoxia is occurring during the harmful algal bloom. Uh, and the co-effects of harmful algal blooms and hypoxia are really unknown. Our meta-analysis pulled up one study. Uh, and finally, the co-occurrence of HABs and hypoxia will certainly become more common in the future. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Chris, for this very uh, stimulating talk. And I really like your four horsemen apocalypse. I think this is perfect. And yes, it is a very special day today for, for, for the US, but for the whole world, actually. So we have a couple of 
question in, in the question box. So nice talk, Chris. Is the direct linkage between bloom and hypoxia in deep water more a function of water depth than the species blooming? Um, I don't think so because, I mean, I'm sure, I certainly depth is important, but I, I didn't say, and I was remiss to not mention, that those systems that I showed that were going anoxic at night were only a few meters deep. And so, and the measurements, as I already showed in those same, uh, the one case I had two different uh, devices measuring dissolved oxygen in the surface and bottom, uh, and that shallow system, the surface water is one anoxic at night as well. So certainly deeper systems will be more prone to hypoxia during HABs, but what I showed is that shallow systems can also become anoxic at night during harmful level use. Okay. Thank you. We have another question. What is the effect on PCO2 during the bloom, if that was recorded? So for those particular events, we don't, the two that I showed, we didn't have data, but we have seen for some harmful algal, I should emphasize, I already showed my talk, remember, there are some that cause basification, uh, not acidification, but there's others that when certainly when you have the anoxia, you have uh, supersaturation of PCO2 and you can have over a thousand uh, microatmospheres uh, of PCO2 during those events, uh, particularly at night. Okay, a more general question. With what dynamic and pragmatic innovation ideas an exceptional application based on Earth's observation, atmospheric surveillance, management, marketing, and energy, which address the global societal and commercial challenges of the 21st century before, during, and after the COVID-19? Uh, um, <laughs> I'm not sure I got the question. There are a lot of words in there, and I'm not sure what the question was. OK. Uh, another question. What is the level of maturity of the model which are simulating the harmful algal blue? Can we forecast them? Yeah, yeah, so there are very good harmful algal bloom models coming online. You know, the important thing for any model for a harmful algal bloom, however, is that it needs to be species specific and it needs to be ecosystem specific. So there's been, for example, great progress on the west coast of the United States, looking at uh, harmful algal bloom in Sudanichia uh, and demoic acid events, and they can predict those uh, fairly regularly. Uh, there's another one for the Great Lakes and microcystis blooms, yet another in the Gulf of Mexico for Coronia brevis bloom. So uh, modeling is coming along, but again, these models must be built species specific uh, and ecosystem specific. Okay, uh, I have a quick question. Actually, you, you, the, the question was whether uh, there is a sequence. We have the HEB first and hypoxia, or you show that for the dinoflagellates, it can be simultaneous. So, um, my understanding was that the Don Anderson's group from Woodsall, they, they, they were trying to, they were quite good in, in forecasting those. Am I wrong? Uh, yes, they've had some success in forecasting those those harmful algal blooms as well in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, those particular events, however, excuse me, the Gulf of Maine. And uh, although I should mention, I would emphasize those events uh, typically are in colder waters, and probably in that event, the uh, hypoxia is less common. Okay. Other question: If there is no hypoxia signal after the H E B advance. Does that mean the most of the algae have already been decomposed? In other words, when, how, and where are the algae of HEB decomposed? Um, I mean, yeah, eventually all the hard flagellables will decompose and lead to further hypoxia, particularly high biomass events. Um, the way they decompose and, and when they decompose is really going to be, just like with the models, an ecosystem and species specific. Okay. 
Uh, let's see if I have more questions. I do not see. So I have another one. People now really to look at uh, climate trends in model. Many people use climate velocities, you know, taking isotherm and seeing how the species have progressed following isotherms. We have been doing that in our group with oxygen concentration, right? But like you say, you could do that with pH, for instance. And uh, your first horseman with HAB, what would you consider for being able to track um, this climate kind of velocity for the HAB? What would you check? Um, that's a great question. I think, um, again, species and ecosystem specific. And you know, I think we all are familiar with the trend in climate change. There are winners and losers. I, it, I think it depends on where you are. So I showed early in my talk in our paper in PNAS in 2017 that you know the it looks like some of these halves are actually shifting towards the poles. And so in areas as the halves are moving into their thermal optimum, the trajectory will be they'll increasing. Where, whereas if they're in an ecosystem already at the thermal optimum and it warms beyond their optimum, those events will become less frequent. So it really, again, species and ecosystem specific answer. Okay, uh, I will go for two more. Has anyone looked at the responses of bentos during HABs or before, during, and after? Uh, yeah, certainly. And I think, um, uh, for, for example, uh, and the, the one species, when I showed the event uh, for uh, Margolifidinium polycricoides and the fact that it went anoxic at night and then uh, superoxic during the day, we were actually, during that study, uh, we pu was published by, I think it's Griffin et al. 2019, I believe in estuaries and coasts. Uh, during that exact event, we had a mass die off of scallops. So we had the scallops there, we we're monitoring day by day. And when the event got very intense, uh, the we lost more than, I think, 90% of the scallops died. Uh, although the interesting thing is that other biomass were less sensitive, uh, oysters and clams, for example. Okay. Our last question. So in the case of deoxygenation and algal bloom, can it be solved by technology and aquatic technology by making a device that can sense hypoxia in the bloom by the time of its occurrence and before it, and that can be done by the special transducer and the scientists can do that by making experimentation by the in vivo and in vivo manner and by the observatory tool. What are else innovative tech? So, in other words, how can we send them? Right. How, say that last part. How can we sense them with sensors? Yes. So there, you know, a lot of what I showed was actually it was basically I showed chlorophyll, of course, but um, you know those devices were all telemetered, so we're able to observe all of these in real time with uh, specific devices and and see, in fact, as it happens every ten minutes. Uh, uh, chlorophyll levels going up and oxygen levels going down. Um, and other colleagues, for example, Don Anderson's group uh, on the east coast of the U.S. and Chris Sholin's group on the west coast of the U.S. had developed what they call the environmental sensor processors, which go even further than looking at chlorophyll, can have molecular probes for specific species and can detect specific species of harmful algal blooms. Okay, a last one. Is it possible to have the same effect on pH and oxygen with not harmful um, algal bloom? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, but again, what we saw, I showed in my first half of my talk, for example, in Jamaica Bay, with the non-harmful species, we tend to see it as the sequence of events. So the bloom dies, and that leads to the hypoxia and the acidification, whereas for the non-harmful algal bloom species, it can be, in some cases, uh, concurrent with the occurrence of the bloom. Okay, I think we, we're all done with the questions. So we would like to thank you uh, warmly, Chris, for this very stimulating talk. And uh, thank you. yes, we talk about comal tip stressor, but we should not forget uh, harmful algal bloom. And Kristen, I put uh, on the screen, uh, I'm pleased to announce our next GONS webinar, which will take place the 17th of February at 2 Central Eastern Time. 
the moderator will be Maria Grégoire, and our speaker will be Daniel Conley from Sweden and Wen Feini from University of Maryland. And uh, we thank you all for being here with us today. We were almost 200 people uh, attending the webinar, and uh, we wish you a good day or a good evening, and uh, bye-bye.